William James, The Will to Believe, continued. Uh, I finished uh, part one with James's point that no philosophy can succeed, which ignores the practical craving after a world which is partly responsive to men's future expectations, their human faiths, and their common sense conviction that uh, moral striving generally counts for something. Takes the question, does God exist? James rejects the agnostic argument that one ought never to hold beliefs for which it, conclusive evidence is lack, lacking. Reasonable persons seek uh, both to avoid error and to attain the maximum amount of truth. Yet there may be questions such that either, or rather neither, yes or no replies are justified by existing evidence, but to which men may rightly give an, uh, an affirmative belief response. James insists that the matter of God's existence is such a question as the as uh, questions about the importance of the individual, the value of life versus suicide, and the possible existence of human free will. How men treat such uh, questions is important. James argues that men may believe certain statements for reasons of the heart when conclusive evidence is lacking and the beliefs help to initiate future discoveries of a practical kind. This thesis forces James to consider the problem of the relation of evidence to belief. Belief involves a willingness to act on some hypothesis. James insists that any proposition may serve as a hypothesis, though he is not always clear about the form of such a hypothesis. I hate that word. I have a bit of a lisp, you know, as you might have noticed. Ordinarily, a proposition like this litmus paper is blue is not considered a hypothesis because it lacks a proper hypothetical form. A proposition of the form, if this litmus paper is put into a given solution, it will turn red, is a hypothesis capable of some testing provided the proper details are supplied. But James had in mind statements of moral and religious belief whose adoption by men might result in bringing about a desired truth. One may help to make another person's attitude friendly towards himself by adopting a believing attitude towards the statement, X is friendly towards me. A belief in some propositions is a requirement of their future possible verification. According to James, religious beliefs may often be of this kind. Religious beliefs involve one assenting to statements for which conclusive evidence is absent. James wants to defend the right of men to hold such beliefs if they meet three, no, if they meet uh, specified conditions. A man has an option to believe certain hypotheses in religion and morals if the hypotheses are living rather than dead, forced rather than avoidable and momentous, rather than trivial. What makes a hypothesis living, forced, and momentous is its relation to a thinker's interests. The test here seems to be predominantly psychological and cultural, for an, individual, an individual's interests are what they are, however caused. James admits that not all men will find the same hypothesis living, forced and momentous, giving the example of a Chinese, of a, I don't know why I said, I don't know why I said Chinese, and maybe because of that piano player having trouble in London recently. Anyway, 
giving the example of a Christian confronted with the command be a, so be a theosophist or be a Mohammedan. Yet James insists that the God hypothesis confronts men with a genuine option, meaning that such an option is living, momentous and forced. He argues that the agnostic, who neither affirms nor denies God's existence, has already decided against such an existence. The agnostic decides to give up all hope of winning a possible truth in order to avoid a possible error in a situation for which evidence must, in principle, be inconclusive. The agnostic's right to disbelieve in this case is no greater than the religious man's right to believe. A critic may say at this point that James' way of arguing may encourage men to choose their beliefs by an individualistic criterion of psychological comfort. Something on the order of the command, believe what you need to believe. James warns his readers that he is countering academic people's disregard of the passional aspects in human decision-making, and the right to believe occurs only in a matter which cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. James apparently thinks the genuine religious option concerns the thatness of God's existence rather than the choice of an existing institutional means for expressing one's decision to believe in God's existence. Yet he does seem to argue, on the other hand, that those who are agnostics choose to treat the God hypothesis as a dead one. Moral and religious options are such that if the believer takes an affirmative stance regarding a belief, they promise that the better aspects will win out in the universe and a man will be better off for believing. One might put even the God hypothesis in a the God hypothesis in a psychological form. If you believe that God exists, even now you will be benefited. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet it is not clear that James would wish to regard the force of the central religious hypothesis as purely psychological. In discussing features of the moral landscape, James once again shows his distrust of intellectual abstractions and generalizations. He is convinced philosophers can never produce an airtight, finished moral system, nor can moral philosophers dogmatically solve all issues in advance of actual situations. And yet... James openly defends two general moral notions. One is that human demands and obligations are coextensive. The second is that men have a right to believe they are free. Any genuinely moral philosopher places his own cherished ideals and norms in the scales of rational judgment, even as he realizes that no one standard measure is attainable which will apply to all occasions. The moral philosopher holds no privileged status for deciding concrete instances of conflict in human demands. James insists that the moral philosopher, and I quote, only knows that if he makes a bad mistake, the cries of the wounded will soon inform him of the fact. James advances the thesis about coextensiveness of demands and obligations in the essay The Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life. There are no intrinsically bad de demands, since demands are simply what they are. Without them there could be no basis of moral life. 
Here James seeks to give due recognition to biological and psychological facts. He wants an ethical republic. Terms like good and bad, whose meanings constitute the metaphysical function of moral philosophizing, refer to objects of feeling and desire. Only a mind which feels them can realize moral relations and moral law. James insists that the moral philosopher must vote for the richer universe, that which can accommodate the widest possible range of human wants. Yet James fails to make, fails to make clear how the philosopher may determine what should pass as the richer universe if all demands have equal status in principle. principle. If all demands have equal status in principle. Right. On this issue, James seems to appeal to intuition, for he argues that the nobler things taste better, indicating that he recognized that some demands are more appealing than others. The most suggestive essay concerned with the moral issue is the Dilemma of, it of Determinism. <coughs> Excuse me. In which James argues that though no proof is possible, man does possess free will. This is a unique defense of indeterminism which presupposes a metaphysical position, namely that the universe is in reality a pluriverse, containing objective possibilities of novelty. The problem which concerns him is that relation of freedom to chance rather than a freedom to cause. Chance is a relative word which tells one nothing about that which it, of which it is predicated. And I quote, Its origin is in a certain fashion negative. It escapes and says, Hands off, coming when it comes, as a free gift or not at all. End quote. James disliked the contemporary distinction between hard and soft forms of determinism. The soft form of determinism argues that causality is quite compatible with responsible action and ethically and ethic and ethical judicability. What James wanted to discover is the metaphysical view necessary to determinism. He concluded it is a view which takes possibilities never actualized as mere illusions. James insists that determinism is unable to give adequate account of human feelings about possibility, the feeling that the universe contains genuine choices or alternatives, objectively real risks. Indeterminism insists that future volitions can be ambiguous and, and I quote, indeterminate Future volitions do mean chance. End quote. According to James, determinism results in an unavoidable dilemma. It must lead either to pessimism or to subjectivism. Men share a universe which daily calls for judgments of regret about some things happening in it. But... If events are strictly necessitated, they can never be otherwise than what they are. Taken seriously, human regrets suggest that though some feature of the universe could not have been different, yet it would have been better if it were different. This reasoning leads to pessimism. James argues that men can give up pessimism only if they jettison their judgment of regret. Men can perhaps regard regrettable incidents, including the most atrocious murders, as teleological links in a chain leading to some higher good. Murder and treachery then cease to be evils, but a definite price 
must be paid for such a teleological optimism. The original judgments of regret with themselves necessitated on the determinist position. Some other judgments that have existed in their place. And I quote, But as they are necessitated, nothing else can be in their place. End quote. This means that whether men are pessimists or optimists, their judgments are necessitated. One escape from this pessimism-optimism impasse is to adopt subjectivism. The practical impulse to realize some objective moral good can be subordinate to a theoretical development of an understanding of what is involved in goodness and evil. The fact of the universe can be valued only insofar as they produce uh, the facts of the universe can be valued only insofar as they produce consciousness in men. Subjectivism emphasizes the knowledge of good and evil in order to underscore the nature of human involvement. Experience rather than the objective goodness or badness of experience becomes the crucial factor for any moral subjectivism. But the indeterminist must reject subjectivism because it fails to do justice to man's empirical notions of the genuinely moral significance of human experience. In addition, subjectivism leads to mere sentimentality and romanticism. James concludes that common sense informs men that objective right and wrong involves real limits, Practical reason insists that conduct and not sensibility is the ultimate fact for our recognition. Only indeterminism can make sense out of this practical insistence on objective right and wrong. Yet indeterminism does not argue that providence is necessarily incompatible with free will. In an example involving chess... James shows how Providence can be like a master chess player who, though knowing the ultimate outcome of the game, must face unpredictable moves by an amateur player. On the other hand, James concludes that indeterminism gives men a special view. And I quote, it gives us a pluralistic, restless universe in which, it, in which no single point of view can ever take up, can ever take in the whole scene. End quote. James concludes that men have a right to be indeterminists and to believe in free will even in the absence of a persuasively final proof.